Good afternoon and welcome to Birkbeck. I'm Nick Keep. I'm the Executive Dean of the School of Science. And it's my pleasure this week to introduce all our Science Week lectures. We've got lectures at four o'clock and six to today, tomorrow and Thursday. So do look on the web. Do, do come along to other lectures if you fancy them. But this afternoon's lecture is by Dr. Phil Hopley and it'll be on caves, climate change and human evolution in Southern Africa. Phil joined us about three years ago from UCL where he, he was a research fellow. He did his first degree in Birmingham. He did a master's in Bristol and a PhD in Liverpool before going to UCL. So he's travelled round U UK universities and, and been in quite a range of departments, geology departments and geography departments. And so, without further ado, I'll introduce to you to Phil to talk about caves, climate change, and human evolution in Southern Africa. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Hello, everyone. So, I'm going to talk about uh, two very different subjects. So, human evolution and climate change. And what I hope to show by the end of this lecture is that these two different subjects can be uh, melded together and hopefully we can say something about how climate change might have influenced our early evolution. So to do this I'm going to first of all just introduce some of the main aspects of human evolution looking at the hard evidence, the fossils that we have uh, mainly from Africa at this time. Then I'm going to talk about the geological record of climate change, how we can look at climate change beyond the last few hundred years when we could take measurements of temperature and rainfall. How do we reconstruct the climate millions of years ago? And then why, why would we even expect climate change to, to influence evolution? So we have to discuss that a little bit. And also, when we're talking about climate, we have to think about what an individual is doing in their environment, their walking, eating, there. so it, we've got to think about the ecology of, of humans in the past. So these are the four topics that we're going to uh, run through. So first of all, we have to think, well, what, is, what do we mean by human evolution, and what is a, a hominin? Uh, actually, I may slip between calling it a hominin and a hominid, uh, because in recent years the terminology has changed and I never quite catch up. I always call it hominids, which is more of a uh, sort of colloquial term, the sort of uh, rather than hominin, which is the, the specific uh, precise term. But anyway, apart from that, what you have here is us, which you can refer to as anatomically modern humans, and our closest living ancestor or living relative is uh, a chimpanzee, and also gorillas and orangutans are very uh, closely related to us. Uh, but we diverged from these species about six to seven million years ago. So at this point here was when we shared a common ancestor. This was the last common ancestor between chimps and us. And so if it wasn't for fossils, we wouldn't really know what happened in this course of seven million years. But fortunately, we do have a um, fossil record, which, strangely enough, the picture of a hominid has strangely been removed from this slide, I think. Uh -huh. Um, but anyway, so the hominids, like Australopithecus, are in this area here. Uh, there should be a line up there. And there's about 20 different species on our side of this evolutionary tree since the split uh, from chimpanzees. And they're defined by uh, bipedalism. That's the ability to walk upright on two legs, which, of course, we know chimpanzees can't do. Um, as I'll uh, talk about... Uh, I'll show you the evidence soon uh, of why we know that all the hominids uh, were bipedal, were upright. So that was the first trait to occur. And then gradually we saw evidence for increased tool uses, tool use. So as we know, modern humans are very good at using our hands and building things. Uh, and then after that we see encephalization, which means uh, increased brain capacity. So we start seeing brain size increasing. And finally, one of the later things to occur in human evolution are things like language and art. Um, so it is interesting to see that walking upright came a long time before the increase in brain size. 
So just before I go on to the... Oh, there it is. It turned up. Um, so that's a good time to just uh, show you some of the actual specimens that we have. Uh, these are all casts of hominids, uh, most of which were found in Africa, uh, with the exception of this being a modern-day uh, gorilla skull. But unfortunately, the poor thing was shot in the head with a big hole uh, bullet um, But as you can see from a, a gorilla, a uh, large, large face, uh, a forward-facing uh, mouth and nose area, large teeth, large canines. And perhaps the most obvious thing is this uh, being in the middle called a sagittal crest. And very large muscles here. Um, sorry, this is called a zygomatic arch. And it's a large space where the muscles for the jaw can go. So you get the feeling from this that gorillas have very large musculature in there um, to help them chew very hard food. And we'll come on to that a little bit later. So, quite a lot of small brain scientists. Brain capacity is very small. And then you're around a chimpanzee. Uh, this is a, um, it's almost an anatomically modern human. It's about 200,000, no, sorry, about 100,000 years old. One of the first modern humans from, this is from Israel, from a cave uh, called Skuru. And you can see it's a fairly small individual, but you can see it's got a very large uh, brain. So between uh, the gorilla and us, we have all the fossil uh, species. And some of the, the earlier species are known as Australopithecines. That just means uh, Austral, as in Australia, so it's the southern hemisphere, so the first time in South Africa. So it means um, the ape of um, southern Africa. And you can see that they were they're probably about this, this kind of height, quite small, upright walking. And um, you know they were bipedal. And so all of these hominids, you know they were bipedal from the positioning of the large hole at the base of the skull. Um, it's called the occipital combat. And it's, if you're, if you're upright, you it's sufficient to walk straight like this. So your um, the spine attaches to your skull, low down here. Whereas if you're a quadruped on four legs, your spine attaches towards the back of the skull. And so you can clearly see this here because in the hominid it's more forward facing. So that's one of the key lines of evidence to prove that hominids were walking on two legs. And so, yes, you can see, relatively speaking, they're small individuals and they also have small brains. Uh, the and it's not really until the origin of Homo, about two million years ago, when we see a, a very large, rapid increase in brain size. So the Australopithecines have brain size similar to chimpanzees and gorillas, but Homo, um, see, it has a, a bigger brain capacity. This is an African species called Homo heidelbergensis, and it's about 200,000 years old in Zambia. So that's just um, a rough guide to some of the fossils. This is uh, called Tom Child. Um, it's a site I've been working at quite a lot recently, and um, it's currently the age is rather uncertain, perhaps 2.5 million years old. But it was the first ever hominid found, and it's um, it's, a, it's a child probably about three years old. Um, and when it was first discovered, because it was a child, it took um, scientific establishment quite a long time to actually accept that hominids were a real biological entity. So we have all this hard fossil evidence for, for the different species. And then we can work out how all the different species uh, are related to each other. So for the last four million years of human evolution, we can see we have the Australopithecines, and uh, they're grouped into two types, so the gracile Australopithecines and the robust. Um, and this, this guy here is uh, a robust Australopithecine. And you can see that he actually has some similarities to the gorilla. So in terms of the sagittal crest, and the large zygomatic arches in the cheek means that although they're not closely related, 
they shared a similar uh, niche. They probably were both adapted to eating hard materials. And that's something I'll talk about a bit later. So this is a, it's called Paranthropus because it's a side branch. Uh, we're quite confident that these guys didn't lead on to any further developments in, in human evolution. They became extinct in about 1.5 million years. Um, so it's the gray cell lobster pipicines that led to early Homo. And then we have Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, and finally some of the more recent species like Neanderthals and, and then us. Uh, so what you notice is today there's only one species of, of human alive, and this is uh, an abnormality. Throughout most of human evolution there have been a number of different coexisting species. And in fact it's only, uh, based on uh, recent evidence, you only have to go back about 10,000 years um, to go back to the time when there, we shared the planet with another uh, hominid. It's called um, the Hobbit from uh, an island called... Flores in Indonesia, and it's thought to have gone extinct as recently as 10,000 years ago. It was a, a little pygmy homo erectus. So each species has to be treated um, as an individual, really. But each of them will be adapted to their environment in their own uh, particular way, with their own uh, mode of locomotion, their own dietary preferences, etc. So it's, uh, it's often kind of said that if you took all of the human fossil record, all of the skulls that there are, you could quite easily fit them in the boot of a family car. And that just kind of shows how little evidence we have. Although these skulls tell us a lot, they're very rare and very hard to come by. That's with people excavating in Africa for uh, getting on for 100 years now. And... The, the location where they come from is two main regions where the hominid fossils are found. We have the East African, East African Rift Valley, so Tanzania, Kenya, and Ethiopia. It's a very famous site, such as Olderby Gorge, Kruby Fora. Um, and the other site is Southern Africa, but, uh, the caves, the limestone caves uh, in Africa where uh, hominids fall into the cave and get trapped and get preserved. Um, and it's only recently that there have been some finds beyond these two regions and the hominids are being excavated from the Sahara uh, from a time when it was a lot wetter and species such as hominids were living in that area. So these two different regions have very different geology, and this explains uh, some of the, the ways in which they're pre preserved and the differences between the two regions. So the East African fossil record is uh, what us geologists sometimes refer to as a uh, layer cake. And if you just think about like a nice chocolate cake, you know, a layer of chocolate, a layer of sponge, a bit of cream on top, it's all very uniform, a, a flat layer with the oldest at the bottom and the youngest at the top. And that's what you kind of expect geology to be like. And in East Africa, you have the added advantage that onto this layer cake, getting little sprinkles of uh, dust, volcanic ash, coming off the volcanoes that are erupting periodically. And this ash is very easy to date using um, radi radioactive decay. Uh, you can look at the potassium and the argon in, in the ash. And so as these lakes uh, deposit uh, material, and they deposit uh, sandstone, clay, fossils. It all gets mixed in with this very easy, easy to date material. And this occurs for about at least the last five million years. There is a continuous record of human evolution. So that side of it is good. On the downside, in East Africa, uh, a lot of the environment where the, the hominids are deposited is a, an open air region around the side of lakes and often the, the elements have destroyed some of the, the skulls, so for example just surface weathering, um, predation by carnivores, so sometimes you actually, when you see a hominid you'll see it's actually more of a jigsaw and the skull has been 
smash into a hundred pieces and the anthropologist has had to glue them all back together again. And often the, the skulls, the, the bodies are disarticulated. You might find a single leg bone or a tooth or a piece of a jaw. You very rarely find a whole specimen. So in contrast, uh, South Africa, uh, the fossil record is very patchy. And it's only in places where you can find caves. So this is a geological map of southern, Af southern Africa. And the blue in these areas is limestone that has caves forming within it. And what happens in the limestone region is the caves are open to the surface. And the animals are either dragged in by predators or they fall in. And often, especially if they fall in, they are just left to, to rot in a large shaft. They can't get out to the surface. And so their whole body is preserved and um, completely articulated. So you have the most complete fossil specimens in, in southern Africa, where all of their skeletal elements are preserved. But the dating is absolutely terrible, because we really struggle to get good radiometric ages. And there just isn't the length of record that you have in East Africa. There's five million years of evolution. Most of the caves seem to be in the area between about 2.5 and 1 million years old. So we have a much more restricted record. So it, it, however we look at it, we have to accept that the, the human fossil record is very incomplete, uh, geographically and temporally. And there's age uncertainties with a lot of the fossils, especially the South African ones. And also, when, when we see the skulls that are collected, we then have to hypothesize about what species they belong to, how each species relates to each other. And there is yeah, disagreement in, in this area too. So in the early years, uh, it was 1923 that Raymond Dart discovered uh, the tongue child. And as I just mentioned before, it, it took a long time till they took his discovery seriously. He named it after the Pinnacles. Uh, it wasn't until the adults were found, uh, also in South Africa, in a site called um, Sirfontein. And then eventually East Africa uh, got on the map and got most of the publicity, with people like the Leakies uh, discovering some lots of very important finds in Olderby Gorge. Um, we also have the Leitoli footprints found in the 1970s. <coughs> this is amazing. Um, as, a lot, as long as this uh, platform uh, of footprints of, uh, I think, three individuals, some adults, some children, uh, walking along in some volcanic ash that became hardened. And so you can see their trackways, and you can see that um, the Australopithecine had a divergent big toe that we don't have today. Uh, and a very famous specimen is Lucy. She's Australopithecus afarensis. Um, and as far as East Africa goes, this is very complete. So Southern African, we have um, this is little foot, most complete uh, skeleton ever found. It's still being excavated. It, it's been in the cave for. Um, almost 10 years now, and I think in the last few weeks they've announced that it's almost ready to come out. They've, they've been excavating it in situ. And then we have gracile and, and robust Australopithecines. And it's also been in the news quite a lot lately in the last few years. Um, a new site was found called Malapa, uh, which had a new species called Australopithecus uh, sediba. And so far over the last few years they've had. Um, about 13 science papers uh, based on this one specimen, well, three, three specimens in the one cave. Um, science being one of the most prestigious academic journals, so they're doing very well for themselves. And it just illustrates how good um, some of these fossil discoveries are. Uh, the reason this one is, is very interesting is because it's very close to the boundary between early Homo and Australopithecus. It's been dated to 1.8 million years old. So, I mean, that's a very quick run-through of the main features of human evolution. And it's telling us 
what happened from a morphological point of view, what, what we see in terms of fossils. Um, but some of the wider questions aren't really being addressed. Um, particularly, how did it happen and, and then why did certain events in human evolution happen? So as for the most important feature, the defining feature of the hominids is bipedalism. Um, and so how did it happen? We don't really know. There's obviously a, a whole range of different possibilities. But it was a, a pre-adaptation, meaning that there were animals living in a forest that just happened to be doing something that was very similar to upright walking. Maybe they were swinging in trees, bipedally, even wading in, in water on their back legs. Um, all these different opportunities for how this trait evolved. Uh, one of which is this idea that most of these relate to being in trees. So being in a forest, we, when we think of primates, we think of forest environments. Whereas hominids have this striving gait, this ability to walk many miles, even to do long distance running. And there has always been this uh, belief that it's related to an open environment. So that in a savanna, grassland environment, uh, a chimpanzee would be would struggle to get around and, and travel very far. Whereas our uh, bipedalism is very energy efficient. It's a good way of getting about. So, why did hominins evolve? So this is kind of a big question, really, because. Uh, the, the fossil record on its own can't tell us why, why it happened. And we want to turn to another line of evidence, and this is geological evidence. So what was the climate doing? Was a change from forest to savanna? Is this forcing humans to come out of the forest and, and walk uh, in the open environment? So if we want to look at this in more detail, we need to start reconstructing uh, the history of the climate of Africa and to try and relate it to different events within human evolution. And that's what we're going to do next. So this is the, the typical picture we might expect to see. The group of hominids walking in a very open savanna environment. As I'll talk about in a minute, savannas haven't been around very long. They're the, the youngest uh, environment on the Earth today. And I'll explain a bit more about it. So, climate change, well, when we think of climate change, we think of uh, anthropogenic climate, so the release of CO2 and maybe global warming in the next couple of hundred years. Uh, but climate change is all about the scale of time that you're looking at. Now, of course, natural climate change, uh, without the use of fossil fuels, has been going on for uh, many millions of years. And we have to sort of break it down into different scales of change. So when we look at the geological time scale, millions of years, that's one set of uh, processes that is occurring. Also we have the orbital time scale. So over a period of hundreds of thousands of years, the Earth's orbit is changing. The Earth wobbles as it moves around the Sun. And this causes changes uh, in our climate, uh, most notably things like ice ages um, and, and warmer periods. And we have some other scales, such as millennial and centennial climate change. And then we have very short things. So we have annual and interannual. So we have just changes in, a, in an individual's lifespan. So for example, if you're a hominid or a person today, then you might experience climate changes over your 30-year life. Or even below climate is your ecology, so seasonal change what temperature uh, extremes you're experiencing between day and night, summer, winter. So when we're looking at these short time periods, we're thinking about how does an individual adapt to the environment they're facing. And when we're looking at these very long scale time scales, we're thinking about how does a species as a whole adapt to the climate? How does it become a new species in the first place? It's called speciation. Or if it's not adapting to it, why does it become extinct? And is the climate responsible for some extinction events? So, 
if we want to look at uh, records of climate in the past, then we have to go beyond the instrumental period and use something called climate proxies. And these are, unfortunately, they're very imperfect, but the best, they're the best thing we have. And uh, a, a proxy kind of means something that isn't what you want, but you think it relates to what you want. <laughs> so, for example, a climate proxy, we can, if we measure things like the chemical variation in ocean sediments, as long as we can uh, test it in the modern day, then we can think we can get towards pulling out the climate signal from it. So we, we take our proxies and we calibrate them based on our understanding of modern processes. And once we know it in the modern day, we go back in time and try and produce uh, quantifiable reconstructions in the past. And one of the main ways we can do this is using um, the chemistry of uh, very common elements such as oxygen and carbon. And we look at things called stable isotopes. Um, and what these are is most, a lot of the elements around us have more than one type that are, are differentiated by their mass. So, for example, when we look at oxygen, 99.8% of Earth's oxygen has a mass of 16. But a small proportion of the oxygen is heavier. It's oxygen 18, and it has two extra uh, neutrons in the nucleus. This makes it heavier, but in every other way it's the same. It's still oxygen, and it behaves in the way that the lighter oxygen does. So these different uh, atoms have the same chemical properties for different masses. Um, so what, they, what happens is they do get differentiated during physical processes. So for example, um, oxygen during atmospheric processes, such as evaporation, precipitation, the, the ratio between the heavy oxygen and the light oxygen will change. So take for example, if you're boiling your kettle at home, it's got a certain amount of oxygen 16 and oxygen 18 in it, but as you're boiling it and the steam is coming off, there's preferentially going to be a lot more oxygen-16 in the steam because it's lighter and it's, um, it reacts faster. So by the time you boil, boil your water dry in a kettle, it will be full of oxygen-18 at, at the end. It doesn't react. So we use this process to try and understand um, climate change. And this is a, a rather complicated diagram. But what it has here is the, the oxygen isotope uh, values that are preserved in marine sediments. So you look at the fossils in the bottom of the ocean, and they're made of calcium carbonate, which has a lot of oxygen in it. And the oxygen isotope ratio will vary depending on the composition of the water, which, in effect, is related to how much ice there is. Uh, at the poles. So it's a, it's a proxy for glaciation, for global temperature. Okay. And what you can see here, that this is a record over the last 70 million years. So the dinosaurs, they went extinct down here about 65 million years ago. And since the dinosaurs went extinct, you can see the curve has been wobbling up and down. This is an approximate temperature, global temperature. So you can see that it's been getting hotter, reaching its maximum around 50 million years ago, when the Earth was the hottest it has been in this record, and then you gradually get this global cooling with a few bottles in between. And this is us heading in to our current ice age. So prior to this point, around 30 million years ago, there was no ice in Antarctica or in, uh, in Greenland, but it started in Antarctica here, and then by about 5 million years ago, this is Greenland became glaciated as well, the world was getting increasingly cold. And as these events are going on, uh, we see different events going on in, in terms of biology and other aspects of the Earth system. So we see continents moving around. Um, we see things like the uplift of the Himalayas. And this happened around 20 million years ago. And if this was happening, um, there was so much opportunity for erosion to take place. And all this chemical erosion was drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And as it did that, it, it 
made global cooling occur even faster because there was less CO2 to cause global warming. So it got cooler and cooler the more uplift there was in the Himalayas. And similarly, we see changes when North America and South America uh, collided um, to create the Straits of Panama. And that's changed the way that the ocean circulated. So on this very long time scale, we see physical changes in the Earth responsible for the climate. So we can say that things like the, the uplift of, of Tibet caused global cooling, changed the climate in Africa, may, have, in a very broad sense, um, explain some of the things that we see in the biology. So we see the, uh, the development of a savanna environment, which I'll talk about a bit later. We see hominids appear. Um, things like that. So, so you get the impression that global cooling did have effects on um, climate in Africa in a very long time frame. But we also have this, this uh, more rapid type of climate change, which is called orbital forcing. So this is the Earth's wobbles. I won't go into too much detail about it, but there are at least three different wobbles. You have uh, a tilt, the Earth wobbles in this way. You have eccentricity, which just means how not circular is the Earth's orbit. Sometimes it's very circular, sometimes it's elliptical. And then we also have uh, precession. That's like, if you imagine the Earth was a spinning top and you spun it, it would wobble like this. So that's different to a tilt. Anyway, each of these different uh, Milankovitch cycles is what they're called, because they were discovered by a Serbian mathematician and astronomer called Milutan Milankovic. And he did amazing mathematics to figure all this out based on um, the solar system and how the gravity of Jupiter and Saturn are, are pulling the Earth and, and moving around. So it was all based on numerical calculations. And he demonstrated these different cycles. And he was a also able to say how much sunlight every part of the Earth was receiving at uh, every different stage over the past hundreds of millions of years. So it's an amazing record that we can look at these curves and we can say 1.2 million years ago there was this many watts per square metre of sunlight hitting East Africa or Southern Africa. So we really get an idea of, of how the solar, it's called insulation, how insulation was changing. Um, and we can suggest that this was affecting the climate as well. Uh, but if we want to get down towards individuals uh, of any species, and obviously in this case we're interested in, in hominids, then we want to think about how is the climate changing on, on the time frame that they were living and experiencing um, in terms of uh, a few decades. So unfortunately, there are currently no data sets that are this precise. Because as you can imagine, the further back you go in time, what usually happens is you lose your resolution and you lose data. So what people do is they, they use the data they have from the larger time scales, things that we know about how much CO2 is in the atmosphere, what, what the broad temperature was like, what the rough configurations of the continents were. And then we put this data into a climate model. So this a climate model is basically it's what uh, scientists who look at future climate change, it's how they predict what the future climate's going to be is how they predict what the weather's going to be like in a, in a few weeks' time. So we may or may not have much confidence in the validity of these models. Um, but it's completely based on maths and <coughs> physics. And you can do failure climate modelling where you try and at least hypothesise about how you think climate was changing at very short time scales, what the seasonal cycle was like, interannual variability, amount of rainfall, all these sorts of things. You can see some of these simulations. This is saying that two and a half million years ago, this map suggesting how much hotter it was uh, compared to the modern day. And it's saying that in Africa, we're <coughs> perhaps two or three degrees warmer um, than we are today. So these, these are very detailed reconstructions. Uh, but of course, we have to be a bit mindful of, of how valid they are. So 
So we can look at climate change in, in all these different manifestations and think, can we pull any of it out and say, does climate change influence human evolution? Why would we even expect it to? Well, as you know, uh, as Darwin pointed out a long time ago, um, all organisms adapt to their environment through the process of natural selection. That's what evolution is. It's, it's changing towards your environment. And your environment can either be uh, the physical environment, so the temperature, the rainfall, or it can be your biological environment. So the competition, the other species that you're living with, disease. So we, we can think of environment in, in those two different ways. And the links between climate and evolution, even today, they're still very theoretical. We don't really understand how um, climate drives evolution. We can make theories, um, but they are quite hard to test. So, and it also, it really does depend on the, the time frame you're looking at, whether you're looking at individuals or species. So, this is the type of thing that people might try and produce. It's uh, human evolutionary history over the last four million years, and you can see all the different species that we saw earlier on. And this is the record of climate change uh, from oxygen isotopes in uh, fossils from the ocean. And what you can also see is, this is a reconstruction of African climate. And um, you can see how much less data there is. It's very data poor here compared to the, to the oceans. We're approximating a data point maybe every 100,000 years, something like that. And that's typical for uh, a terrestrial, a land environment. We find that it's very hard to find decent climate records from places like Africa. So that really is a problem uh, for what we're wanting to do. Um, but despite that, you can say, on the whole, this record shows that we're getting our carbon isotopes changing, and this is a change from woodland to grassland. And what that means, as we suggested earlier on, Africa is drying out, and woodland is becoming savanna, and this might be why um, human evolution is occurring. Uh, I won't say too much about this, but we're, we're trying to compare paleoclimate proxies with the fossil record. And the fossil record is usually is very coarse. So yeah, we might find a hominid every few hundred thousand years. Uh, but actually, if you go to the other end of the time scale, um, you can look at, say, an individual's tooth, a hominid's tooth. And we can do chemistry on it. And we can look at how... It, the, that hominid's environment was changing at a monthly basis. So we, we have this missing ground in the middle, but we can get very high resolution or very poor resolution data, which I'll talk about a bit later. So, as I've already suggested, understanding the savannah environment is crucial if we want to understand uh, the environment of human evolution. And savannah grasslands are the youngest ecosystem on Earth. They're less than 8 million years old. And the reason for this is that savannah grasses are a completely different type of vegetation to anything else that we have on the planet. They photosynthesize in a fundamentally different way. So all other plants are called C3 plants. And they have a particular way that they photosynthesize. Uh, but savannah grasses have involved a unique way of doing this. Um, because they were struggling to survive in hot conditions that were very dry and also low CO2 because as we were going into this ice age CO2 was falling and plants in Africa and in uh, equatorial America all these low latitude areas the plants were really struggling and they had to evolve a new way of surviving in photosynthesizing and so what they did they developed this new mechanism called C4 photosynthesis and the reason I'm mentioning it is it enables us, it's, a, it's an amazing tracer of the savannah environment. Because grasses, these grasses photosynthesize so differently, you can trace their carbon and where it goes. So they have a 10 mil difference from all other vegetation. And this means any animal that eats a savannah grass or any animal that eats that animal, we can tell by tracing 
the carbon. So we know we can look at carbon and we can look at oxygen isotopes to understand African climate. Uh, and this is a, a cave that I've been working on for a number of years now. Um, from southern Africa, it's called Buffalo Cave. And I did some very boring detailed measurements, thousands of measurements along these uh, stalactites, flowstones, and uh, I can produce records like this that are very similar to what we see in the ocean, but are for the first time we're seeing this sort of resolution in uh, a terrestrial environment in Africa. So it's a much better way of comparing human evolution is to use the records that we're getting from the caves in South Africa. And we can see we have orbital cycles, we have um, changes related to increasing uh, savanna grasses. So we're going to talk a bit more about getting as much data as we can from the caves and how we can compare it with individual hominids. So as I was just saying, that C4 grasses, which are savanna grasses, are, um, are a way of tracing uh, the environment. So if you look at this plot here, this is carbon isotopes down at the bottom, and they tell us what different species, different individuals have been eating. So we can see here we have browsers, like an impala, and these are, they eat only trees, they eat leaves, they have a very different carbon isotope composition to the teeth of grazers like wildebeest, who um, will only eat grass. And so you can see this distinction in this plot here. Uh, the impala would be over here, and the wildebeest would be down here. And then we can look at primates, hominids, uh, carnivores, and see what their carbon isotope values look like. And we can see straight away that early homo and Australopithecus robustus, uh, the one with the big um, the big jaw muscles, you see they have a mixed signal. So this means that they were eating foods, some of which came from savanna grasses, some of which didn't. They had a, a mixed diet um, in, a, in a similar way to some of the carnivores that we have, leopards, and sage, and tigers, having a similar sort of dietary intake. So we can actually start looking at this in more detail to get an understanding of, of what they were eating. Um, we can compare South African hominids to East African ones and try and work out uh, actually what it was that they were eating. So this is the, the mixed values that we have for Southern African hominids. Um, but in recent years, some very interesting data has come out showing that um, one of the robust australopithecines from East Africa had a very heavy value, and that meant it was eating only C4, uh, savanna grassland derived material. And this is a bit weird, hard to explain, because um, there's going to be three sources of this savanna grasses. So you're either going to be getting it from eating meat, or from eating termites, because they eat grass, or from um, some strange plants which are uh, things like papyrus that live in wetlands, and you eat their storage, the underground storage organs, which we, we think of them as like potatoes, you know, that you dig under the ground and get this very nutritious tubers, and you eat those, and they give you a C4 signature. So we've got to kind of work out what is it they were doing. So if they've, if they've got 80% of their diet comes from this unknown source, um, it can't be meat. Because um, although today, if living in the Arctic, people can survive on very heavily dom meat-dominated diets, but you can't if you're living in Africa because the meat is so lean, and you get something called protein poisoning, and you can die in a matter of weeks or months. So we know that this means that these individuals weren't eating a purely meat diet. Um, we can say, were they eating termites? Well, that's also very unlikely because you'd have to spend a lot of time termite fishing. You'd have to eat a lot and lot of time. So it seems quite likely that just based on this isotope evidence, that we can suggest that that species was spending its time eating underground storage organs in aquatic plants. So it was wading into the water and digging them out. So that sounds a little bit far-fetched, really, just based on some chemistry. 
Um, but it turned out that you know, if we looked hard enough, it's possible to find um, bone tools. So this is from one of the caves in South Africa. And uh, these bones have been modified uh, based on the polish and scratches that are on the surface. And they are very similar to tools that you make by attacking termite mounds. So the suggestion is that some hominids were getting some part of their diet from termite foraging. And some were also getting their sea bog opponent by wading in the water and taking underground storage areas like the Spinova is doing from West Africa. So that's quite a powerful sort of insight you can get using the chemistry of the fossil teeth. Uh, but when we go a step further than that, because the analyses I've shown up to now have been a single measurement on, on a tooth. So if you use lasers and go very high resolution, you can get monthly records of how the diet of an individual is changing over time. And that's what we have here. And you can see that an individual hominid, its diet is changing. And what this most likely represents is seasonal variability in, in the diet. So African, uh, the environment, the climate in Africa is very seasonal. We have a wet season, we have a dry season. And so the, the food, the plant types and the food that's available to you are going to change depending on the season. And it's quite possible, we don't know yet which, but in one season to the other season, the hominids are having to change their diet into something called a fallback food. That means it's not your favourite food, but you know you want to survive, you have to fall back to the, your less preferred food item. That's something that a lot of primates do today, and there's evidence that um, early hominids had preferences for certain fallback foods. So if we want to understand how an individual is uh, choosing their diet and their environment, at this really fine scale, then it'd be great if we could get some climate records that were equally detailed. And this is where the stalactites from South Africa come in uh, that I've been working on. Um, because what we find when we look in detail using a new um, microscope technique, this is a, a confocal microscope, which provides much better detail than the conventional one we used to use, you can see thousands upon thousands of annual layers preserved in the stalactites. And what we can do is we can count and measure them, and they relate to the amount of rainfall. The thicker the band, the more rainfall there is that, that year. And so we can take images with hundreds of thousands of uh, photos all stitched together, and we count the bands. We have hundreds of thousands of bands. I won't go into it, but you know we have a lot of detail. And this, what this enables us to do is to look at how the uh, Earth's orbit is changing, the orbital cycles, and have a look at how um, annual climate is changing as the Earth's orbit is changing. Um, so it's still work in progress, but I think it's it's a lot. It's going to provide a lot more information on on hominid habitats as we go through with this work. And also, we can look at one of the least understood parts of climate variability, which is El Nino. Um, so this is a Pacific, uh, Pacific Ocean tropical climate variability, which happens between every two and, and nine years. And we can look at this way back in the time when the hominids were living. And we can see, did this sort of variability affect um, hominids? So in, into the years to come, we're hoping that we can correlate some of these records with the, the isotopes in teeth. Um, so, in conclusion, um, understanding the climate and the environment is, cr is critical to the understanding of human evolution. Um, but they're both very complex. Evolution is complex, climate is complex, so when you stick the two together, it's, it's even worse. But we do have some understanding, and we can say quite confidently that human evolution it did occur because of climate change in a broad sense. It was the spread of savanna grasses. Um, the, the way that they replaced, replaced forests that encouraged hominids to stand on two legs and, and walk across the savanna. But we want to go further than this and we want to be able to say um, you know, what was the seasonal variability like, what diet um, 
where the hominid's eating, and um, how do they provide extremes of temperature, and all these things. So there's still lots more to do into the future. And that's, that's it for now. Well, it's not actually whether it's nearer or further from the sun. If you average the whole amount of sunlight on the Earth, it's actually always the same. It's about the distribution of that sunlight at different latitudes. So that sometimes the, the poles have got more or less than the other pole. So it's about, it's about the latitude. It's how energy is distributed over the latitudes and over the seasons. It's not about how much, as a whole, um, the Earth is receiving. Okay. So, th so that's why I say ice ages is because it's very critical the temperature at near a pole. Um, so at different phases of the orbital cycle, it will be more likely to grow ice sheets because you'll have cold summers, and those cold summers will stop ice melting, and so the ice will stay there till the next year. And that's why you get an ice sheet building up. That's from astronomical it's measurements. Astronomical. Yeah. So it's based on, on looking at other things? Or so it's from, it's from an understanding of gravity and the motion of the uh, planets in the solar system and calculating how they all pull on each other and how they affect. So it's, it's very complicated. I don't understand it, but they, it's, you know, it's pretty robust. And it's been shown to be robust because we have some climate records that show very strong uh, sort of pacing. They, they have the same periods as the, oh, as the reconstructed yeah. Yeah, so curves. So, yeah, we see it. Whenever you look anywhere geologically, you find those cycles. You see a 20,000-year cycle, 100,000-year. And it definitely... So the major transitions from ice ages to interglacials and ice ages is to do with the orbital forces. They, they do, yeah, definitely, because they can be dated very accurately. Yeah. You mentioned a big increase in brain size. Mm. I was wondering what reasons there were for that proceeding. Mm. Because of a more meat based diet. That's one of the contributing factors. Yeah, I think when, when we talk about meat, um, often that's, that's thought to be later in human evolution. So, with um, within Homo, things like Neanderthals often be reconstructed as having a very high meat-based diet. Uh, although, at, at some point, um, maybe 10 years ago, it was seen as you know, Neanderthal had almost like 90% meat in its diet. Um, but some of those reconstructions have, have changed a bit through uh, reinterpretation of the isotope data. Um, but I think we do think it is, would have been dominated by meat. So perhaps up to us. Um, whereas the, these guys, these are probably fairly low in their, their meat. They're probably more likely to be getting their um, this C4 signal from um, from tubers, from termites. Um, the its archaeological evidence is also a good way of seeing how much meat's been consumed. I mean, you can't tell how much. Uh, you can you can look at stone tools. They have you can see bones of different animals that have got cut marks in them. They've obviously been butchered meat. Um, but you don't know whether they were doing that, whether that was a treat once a year or whether they were doing that every day. Um, if I understood correctly, I think uh, it was the appearance of the savannah was caused, one cause of evolution. Um, was uh, the current of ice ages probably, uh, was that an effective evolution of humans? 
Um, well, uh, it depends on the, on the time. By, by the time you get to um, the last sort of million years or so, you get much stronger um, cycles between glacials and interglacials. And there are arguments that that might have affected us. Um, but really, the glacial stuff is happening outside of Africa as you go towards the poles. So things like Neanderthals are living in Europe in the Ice Age. Um, so a lot of their uh, evolution and eventual extinction may well have been related to the Ice Ages. Um, every, every time the ice expanded, they would have had their sort of range restricted and then expanded. And, um, it's possible. I mean, they, they had a number of adaptations for a cold environment. Even there, they, they had a lot of sort of large noses and that helped sort of warm up the cold air that was coming into there. Um, and also their, their body shape as well. Um, less extremities. You know, quite a squat frame and, and broad so that they didn't lose heat. Yep. Well, um, you know you're talking about the Hobbit. Yeah, yeah. Living Java, you say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah an island, uh, Flores. Um, when uh, humankind first left Africa, mm -hmm. uh, like our craving, the, the, uh, the Hobbit was the humans that left there, were they similar to us? And if we were, how did the Hobbit like reach money to get all the way to right. Java? <laughs> was it okay. two separate species that left? So, yeah, there, there have been a number of different migrations out of Africa. So, at the time we've been talking about, the um, first migration out was at about 1.8 million years ago, and it was Homo erectus. Once, once he evolved with his larger brain, possibly his use of fire, etc., he migrated out and actually covered most of the old world, you know, everywhere apart from um, America and Australia. So, he, he went all the way over to China and um, you see him in Georgia and Indonesia and places. So from from about 1.8 million years ago, um, Homo erectus was out, and but us we came in a, in a later wave, about 120,000 years ago, which is a lot more recent. That our ancestors came out from Africa and populated the world, um, but the Homo erectus was still there, and it was in the island of Flores where it's obviously a very restricted environment. So whenever you're lots of mammals when they're on islands, they dwarf, they get shrunk because there's less resources. Um, so they, that pygmy, Homo erectus, survived on the island of Flores longer than all the rest of the Homo erectus did. We don't know why the rest of Homo erectus died out, possibly competition with modern humans or just whatever. Um, but that was the last population of Homo erectus to die out, and it was perhaps as recently as 10,000 years ago. So Flores, yeah, the, yeah. That, that, was a, that evolved from Homo erectus. But everything else was modern humans, a, new, a later wave. Yeah, do you need to look back? Um, just wanted to clarify, was the emergence of savannah grasslands due to exclusively nursing out of or was it also climate change? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. It's, um, it's either going to be CO2 or it's temperature or rainfall. And it's probably some combination of them. We know that CO2 was, was reducing. Um, and rainfall was reducing as well at that time. Um, so it's, it's probably... It, the CO2 uh, makes good sense from, in terms of the physiology of the, of the plants. Um, because we know at, at high temperatures you have in tropical environments... Um, something called photorespiration occurs, which is sort of the opposite of photosynthesis, and it's really bad you know, for plants, and that happens when you have low CO2 and high temperatures. So it's always been assumed that this the reduction in CO2 forced um, the evolution of C4 plants. Um, and you actually see it, you don't just see it in one area, you see it in about 30 different groups of plants all evolved this on, on different continents. So there's a global um, need for plants to, uh, to adapt to this new environment of of reduced CO2. Yep, they did in red. Yeah, yeah, so it's about um, based on it's quite a nice combination of um, fossil evidence and, and recent genetic evidence. So the fossils have always said. 
somewhere between five and seven million years that was the last common ancestor, and the genetic evidence has come along and, and said something very similar. As well. Yeah, I mean, people people always disagree on on some species because they get lumpers or splitters. Some people like to split everything into different species. Other people. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if you want to, if you want to put a sort of a slightly cynical hat on, you could say, how come there's not very many um, fossil chimpanzee species? Um, because when you're when you're very close to the divergence down here, it's actually quite hard to spot. Is it on the hominid side? Is it on the chimp side? And you can imagine that if you say it's on the hominid side, or you believe it to be on the hominid side, that, you know, it's higher profile. It's more exciting. So some of the very early ones, we actually don't know. Very, there's a lot of debate to which branch there are. Um, but the reason there aren't that many fossil uh, chimpanzee species is partly because they, they continue to live in a forest environment. Um, a tropical forest uh, with very acidic soils is one of the worst places for the preservation of fossils. And it's still covered in forest today, so you know, there's no fossil discoveries happening in, in the Congo, for example, where we might find fossil chimpanzees. I think they have found one or two individual specimens, um, but the, yeah, the chimpanzee fossil record is, is terrible. I yeah. think, uh, how do you know when you have found a new species, but you have to just use the evidence you know that much, how, how do you say you have to use a new species? Or? Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's various uh, criteria that you have to, to, mat, to meet. Um, so it has to be these are all uh, morphological species because we don't have any genetic data to. Um, but you, you look at the, uh, the physical differences between different species today and you say, well, the, the morphology of these is, is so different to anything else that it must be a different species. So you can't, you can't use the, the biological species concept, which we use, which is can, can an individual mate, you know, if you can't produce viable offspring with another group of organisms then you're in different species whereas in fossils you just have to do it based on what they look like based on the morphology so that that's why there is some disagreement okay thank you for all your, all your questions and thank you for coming if you fancy coming to any more of the lectures in science week do turn up there at four and six today tomorrow and thursday and i'd just like to thank phil once again for a very interesting talk <laughs>